All right, if you would extend your hands out to him, and we're going to pray. Lord, I just thank you, Father, for Scott, and um, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would just move through him. Pray that our hearts would receive this word. Prepare our hearts, Lord, that our hearts would be ready. And, um, yeah, may we bear much fruit from this word. Thank you, Lord. Come, we just commit our church and our church family to you right now. Holy Spirit, just come and be in our midst. Thank you for worship. Thank you for the presence. We just, we just long for more of you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. All right. Well, it's another beautiful Sunday morning. How many people are grateful to be alive in Jesus? Yeah. Hallelujah. Um, so I'm going to jump into a message this morning that's really important because it's actually um, it's going to be a, a, an action message, something that we can really uh, apply, real, we can have real application, get into it, and, and do it. Hopefully, pretty much all messages have that aspect to it, the, the application, but we have something that, uh, a direction that the Lord's been speaking to us um, for a few months now, just kind of reminding us of some really some of our genesis of this ministry and some of the DNA of how it started and how it applies till now. You know, it says the, the, the first will be last and the last will be first. You know, and, and there's different ways of looking at that. I won't get deep into that, but, there, but I do believe that there's something about the first will be last in the, in the church, in the history of the church, that the, the way the genesis of the first century church will be seen again uh, some of the things that were so successful, so phenomenal, uh, this little group called The Way and the way they were able to uh, literally uh, turn the world upside down with the power of the gospel. Uh, some of the things that they did we need to look at because I believe the first will be last. It'll come back at the last and the last church when Jesus returns. So we're going to look into some of that. And um, just before that, I, I got a couple of little jokes for you. How about that? Hello. Just to warm us up, yeah. Okay. So, what's a what's a missionary, or you could say an evangelist's favorite vehicle? What is it? You don't know. No one knows. A convertible. Con convert. That's for Daniel. Yes. You'll, soon you'll be seeing Daniel driving a convertible. Maybe, maybe not. A Bronco convertible. How about that? Oh, now you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of church did, or sorry, what kind of car did Jesus drive? Honda Accord. No, that, that's the first century church. They're all in one accord. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one too, eh? Now, what kind of uh, car did Jesus drive? A Chrysler. Yeah. You were going to say that? Oh, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> you got to be a little quicker, just a smidge quicker. All right, uh, should we do one more? What else one we more, got? One more, one more. One more for the road. What's a mathematician's What's a mathematician's favorite book of the Bible? Oh, everyone get that one. Numbers. That was not really even funny. It was just kind of just kind of just kind of there. But it, it could be true. Someone's got to like numbers. I enjoy it. Um Let's see. We'll do one more cuz we can't end on that one, can we? Let's see. <laughs> okay, what time of day does Adam prefer? Evening. Oh. Evening. Oh. All right. Hello. Okay, we better stop soon. If we, we could shrink the church if we keep going. All right, so let's pray and we're going to jump in here. Lord, we just thank you for joy and, uh, Lord, that we can be joyful always and be grateful for how you've treated us in this life, Lord, how you've made a way when there was no way, how you've literally gone before us, Father God, and you sent Jesus to be our deliverer, our Savior. And Father, we thank you that you've given us a mission in this life, Lord. We're not just here taking up space. We're not just waiting for heaven. Lord, we have been given a commission, a mission in this life. And Lord, help us all to maximize that, Lord. 
and, and to uh, be obedient servants, Lord. Show us, give us revelation this morning, we pray, as we talk. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so let's go to uh, Acts chapter 2. Like I said, we're going to go to the beginning of the church, New Testament church. And start in uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And we can stand for the reading of God's word. Starting in verse 42, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods, and they gave to everyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts they broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Isn't that awesome? Just, just, just uh, the image, the picture of all that is just beautiful. Uh, and then let's go to First um, Peter chapter 2, starting at verse 4. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God, precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Please be seated. So just starting with that second passage there, saying that, um, that we're being built together like living stones, uh, a, a spiritual dwelling, a place where the Lord dwells. And he, chose to, he chooses to dwell in us as we, we know our body is literally a temple of the Holy Spirit. Just pinch yourself there and go, wow, this is, I'm the temple of the Holy Spirit. But also there's a corporate coming together, being built together like living stones, creating a spiritual house, becoming a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. So this is a, a profound picture of the church, the way God has intended it. And it's all built on, on, uh, on Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, who is rejected by men but chosen by God for the mission. And, and many of us have been through that too. You've been through uh, rejection. But just the rejection of man does not mean you're not chosen by God. It doesn't mean you, gotta, you, you don't have a work to do or your mission doesn't change just because everyone doesn't accept you or understand you or endorse you. Does that make sense? And so we all have a calling. We have a work to do. We have a limited amount of time. We all have an expiration date. And none of us, we don't know when, when we're done here and we go into the heavenly realm. But we want to be effective. Is that true? Does anyone here want to be effective? What we're called to do? And as we look at the first century church, we see if there's one thing you could say, man, they were effective. They got it done. You might say, well, how did they do that? Like, what did that look like? And uh, we know, of course, they had the privilege of the, the disciples became the apostles of literally rubbing shoulders with Jesus, quality time with him. I mean, that's got to count for something, and it really did because those, those very uh, men and women, and ultimately it was 120 that were uh, gathered together in the upper room waiting for what Jesus said was, would be the power of the Holy Spirit, waiting for the power to to uh, come upon them so they could do the mission. And how many people know that the work of God is not to be done uh, by might or by power, but by His Spirit, by the power of His Spirit? Like we got lots of like, like gimmicks and tricks and 12 steps, and some of that stuff's good. But I'm telling you, when it comes down to it, are we, are we being led by the Spirit? Are we spiritual people? Right? And, uh, and so are we a spiritual house? Because there's a lot of houses that can be built in man's efforts. And I feel like sometimes we've fallen short in our Western version of Christianity where we look at even mega houses and churches and, you know, uh, like, like they always say, they got, we got the skinny jeans and the big screens and the smoke machines, you know, but do we have the Spirit of God? Does this make sense? Do we, is, is His Spirit dwelling here? Can we, is there a tangible presence and, uh, and I believe God, we're in, a, in an extraordinary time where God wants to pour out His Spirit. In times of darkness, it says that's when our light shines, when it shines the best. And so I believe the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, some of you guys have been, I didn't even get to ask Daniel how he went up to Asbury uh, College. Some of you guys have heard the Spirit 
uh, breaking out up there. You want to give us a quick report? He drove up there yesterday, and uh, I got, uh, he got in late. But um, if Asbury College is a historic college where there's been an outbreak of the spirit. I think it was maybe in the 70s. And we went up there and kind of about 10, maybe 12 years ago, and, and did our part, kind of a covert mission of stoking the fire. We met with some hungry students that were just like longing for Jesus to break out. But at that time, there was a chaplain that uh, kind of wanted to keep a lid on it, all that Holy Spirit stuff. And so, I, you know, they went from inviting me to speak at the chapel back in the day to saying, you know what, we're not really allowed, you know, and, and, but we still want to worship, and would you guys come? And, and so we came, and we did kind of like these secret meetings and, and prayed for them. And, and this was, uh, so people have been praying and contending and believing that God would pour out a spirit. So there's a remarkable thing that started last Wednesday and we'll tell us about it, what you experienced. Yeah, no, it was, it was awesome. I, I don't know if you know the full story, but basically uh, they had a normal chapel at Asbury University in Kentucky, and um, a few of the students decided to, to link. They invited the rest of the students, hey, if we want to linger longer in the presence of the Lord and worship, we're going to stay here. And so they just began to worship, and the Holy Spirit just began to move, and uh, students began to cry, and and then within hours, hundreds of students were in the chapel just going after the heart of God. And they went on for hours. The same musicians from uh, 10 a.m. I think they were going for almost like eight hours, something crazy, um, of just worshiping, pouring their hearts out before the Lord. And then t- I, guess the, I guess it just spread and tons of people just began to hear about it and began uh, to become attracted. Anyways, now it's still going um, even throughout the night. People are, are going, and um, uh, I, sh- I had a free afternoon yesterday, and I didn't have much going on, and I was like, I just kept hearing about it, and it was going through my head. I was like, I'm just going to go, and so I just got hopped in my car. I didn't have anything with me. and just went for it, and um, it was amazing. It was really, really powerful uh, what the Lord is doing there. There was, I think the thing that was most special to me was it there was nothing, the Lord is using some very awkward people. <laughs> I'm serious. He's using some of the most awkward people to pour out his spirit in an immense way. Like we're, we're talking, I showed up, the sound was terrible. The, the, it was one guy on a guitar just pouring out his heart in a very like bad to average cajon player. And, but the people there were just desperate for Jesus. Like there, there was just nothing else that could attract you, maybe besides the amount of people that were coming, besides the Lord. And that's what was so special about it. And to see that many people just coming, coming in, there was no seats available. People were standing room out in the, uh, standing out, the doors were open. People were standing out all the way up to, up to the steps, like outside, that is. Like it was just unbelievable. And so it felt like, you know, um, these, and, and I love how they're protecting the purity of worship and they're protecting the purity of Jesus and, and only seeking Jesus. And um, it was just extremely powerful and it was, it was as if like all these um, administrators there um, and maybe even the awkward Bible teacher there was just being used. Like, it just was unbelievable. Like, it just, there was nothing, I don't know, nothing that you would expect. <laughs> I don't know, this is the best way to put it. But the Lord was working because the people were hungry for Jesus. And so, I, it felt like, spiritually, there's like a balloon, and it felt like something's about to pop. They have had four days of consecration and repentance, and just have preached consecration day in and day out. And it feels like there's, there, I, I won't, I'll, I know the Holy Spirit's working, but I really believe that they're stepping into something like in the book of Acts where they're going to walk in signs, wonders, and miracles. It felt like it was just getting ready to break. And that's what the message was last night. It was four days of consecration, like Joshua saying, consecrate yourselves, and then the Lord will do mighty works And before they stepped into the river. And he said that well, they're coming into a season of the river. So be praying for Asbury. Be praying for the, the people. And it was just a bunch of redneck people, like just packed out. Like it was no hype. No skinny jeans, no smoke machines. Like, it was awesome. It was so good. Anyways. Good, good, good report. Very good. 
Awesome. So, and, and then you already there's been different groups coming from all different universities and catching the fire, and it's start, they say it's already starting to spread in other universities. How many f people feel we need a Jesus revolution to break out across our land? And I believe we're in that time. I believe God's going to start moving in, in an unusual way. It's already, that's, that's a story, a picture of it, just three hours away from us. And, um, and so we have to be ready. We have to get ready for the outpouring of the Spirit. And so this morning I want to talk to you about something that I, I feel like the Lord has directed us to, to begin to implement, to begin to move towards. Because uh, the bottom line is, uh, even Friday night, we could do a whole report on what happened there at Wilco. There was like at least 30 kids got saved, maybe more, and then others, a dozen or two more rededicated their lives down at the heart of, uh, of Franklin, the, the old historic Franklin Theater, just an amazing outpouring amongst the teenagers, this team, Daniel and the whole crew, uh, Evan, Bree, you guys did a fantastic job. Uh, just they got a beautiful team, and, and, and it's remarkable the amount of student leaders that are engaged and on fire, and, and it's just there's something fresh. God's breathing again fresh, in a fresh way on, on Wilco. And so, I mean, God's pouring, what's that? And the MERS, yeah. Oh, that's right. That was last week. So all these things are just, are just amazing that we get to be, help steward these things. And uh, so proud of the young generation, Colby, all you guys are just killing it, you know, just uh, just being a wineskin by which God can pour out his spirit. So it's happening, guys. So what do we do when, when uh, the multiplication comes? When, 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 you know, Sarah and I and any leader can, you know, can only, you only have so much time and space in your life, and then you're just like, I'm done. I, can't, I just can't do it, right? And so God is, I believe, going before us in a preparation for the outpouring that's coming so that we'll be ready. You, you, who wants to be ready for the outpouring? Yeah. Amen? And so I feel like uh, what I'm going to talk to you about, and we just touched on it through what we read about the New Testament church, the, uh, the first century church. Um, and so let's, I'm going to read you another passage. Um, so even with Jesus, he started with just a small group. Someone say small group. And we're in, in this talk this morning, I talked to you about life groups, because I believe it's that vital. It, it, vital. It's your life depends on being connected in a, in a, in a strategic way, in a, in a holistic way, in an authentic way. Uh, but also you can interchange life group with small group. Uh, and, and many places all around the world, they literally, this is the church. That's like, it's the, they're called house churches. All, I mean, China, they've been underground church. They meet in homes for, for decades now. And they thrive. And so we see that the early church... Uh, you know, they met in the homes, but they also met at the, in the, the courtyard of, of the temple. So there's corporate gatherings, there's small gatherings. So we're going to talk about both. Is that okay? We can be biblical and talk about both? Because a lot of people, they just get bizarre. They get, just, their pendulum just swings, or they get hurt in a corporate church. They're like, oh, I'm done with that. It's all small groups. And they go to a small group. Then eventually that small group grows, and then all of a sudden they have to have a leader. And then all of a sudden they get hurt there. And then they're like, oh, back to the corporate church. I can hide. No one knows me here. <laughs> and then they go back to an intimacy place. And then the, So it's something that we see was Im implemented from the beginning, and they were doing both. And I believe they, who did they learn it from? That first century church. From Jesus. Jesus left them an example that they should follow. They didn't just fall into this stuff. They saw a pattern. They saw a model, a, 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 an example, and his name was Jesus. And they implemented those things. Um, and so let's look at um, Jesus for a moment from Mark chapter 3, verse 13. Because it all started with him, and even the small groups started with him. As he, uh, verse 13 says, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him, those he wanted, how many people know God wants you? <laughs> you're chosen. He called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. If you're really his, you will come to him. You'll hear the call, and you'll respond. And so we know that the disciples left everything and followed him, left everything at once, it says, for most of them. And it says, and he appointed 12, designated them apostles that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. <laughs> so this was no ordinary little small group. This wasn't just a little kumbaya club. 
This was literally frontline warriors that were going to do damage to, to hell itself and cast out demons and set captives free, and they would begin to preach the gospel, and signs and wonders would follow them. But it started with being called out into a small group, into a place of, of intimacy with the Lord himself and with others, okay? And so a little history on this ministry. You might say, you know, because we've, we've had a lot of seasons. We've been in this, if you can imagine it, uh, September will be 30 years anniversary, so we're going to figure out how to celebrate, you know. And uh, so we've had a lot of, but even before the 30 years, I had about three years ramping up to that in what we call a small group or a life group, a bunch of guys. We just kind of stumbled into it because our church at the time uh, hadn't, uh, actually we hadn't really heard about it. It was about uh, three or four years later uh, when Belmont, we went to Belmont Church back in the day, that when uh, Don Finto got up and he goes, people are going to say, I'm crazy, trying to do this, trying to take a, a back then it was a mega church and, uh, and, and, and institute small groups. And, 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 uh, but when, when he, I remember when he said, this is what we need to do and this is where we need to go. People need to be known and heard and seen and connected and all this good stuff. We about jumped out of the balcony of that church. We're like, yes, that's where it's at. Because we had, we had literally experienced such fellowship, such, such bounty of the Lord, such revelation in this little Thursday night men's prayer group. And God was, was meeting with us in a peculiar way, in a beautiful way, in an authentic way. And we were getting real, we're getting clean, we're getting honest, and we were growing. Even though we would go to church on the weekends, we'd go to the corporate meetings, we'd go to the conferences, but there was something about that little incubator, that little life group. And what God was doing. And then when I met Sarah, not long after that, she started a, a ladies group. It was 30, we, we called it back then a Thursday night prayer group. And it was ladies. And that was powerful. And out of the synergy of what God was doing with those relationships, somehow we had what it took to begin to step into the mission that we're doing now. See, intimacy produces life, just like how we have babies. Intimacy, and then they're, oh, whoop, there's a baby. Well, in the spirit, it's true, too. If you, if you come together uh, and you connect with people in an intimate way, God's going to produce life. He's going to produce, it, all of a sudden, you're going to start having vision. You're going to have unction to function. You're going to, like, God's going to visit you in a special way, just like he did his apostles, just the, the disciples that he called to himself. And so out of that gathering back in the day that we were doing, and actually, uh, there's even a, a bit of a root system all the way back to what Jay Fryer is doing with the, uh, <laughs> to the Thursday night men's group, which is amazing to think of one of our, our guys that was part of our Thursday night group way back 33 years ago was part of uh, launching what Jay's now stewarding and some other great men of God, an uh, amazing group that meet in a barn called the Barn Men, but just fellowship and intimacy and and and. and God meeting with people. And then Daniel and, and Colby, and I don't know who all, uh, Evan, I guess you guys all met. See, look at that. The synergy of these groups, these the, being tucked away with Jesus, kind of pulling aside. They all met, I think, over at the um, barn men as well. And, and then I was so excited because it was generational. And all of a sudden, Daniel was like, what, 18 years old or something? He was like, I'm going to this men's meeting. I was like, man, you're going to get something. You're hanging around a bunch of men going after Jesus. You're, something's going to fall on you. You're gonna, that's the fast track, guys. It's called the fast track. When you get generational, if you're just hanging out with only your one generation, it's one dimensional. If you, if you add another generation, you got, you, got, you, got, you got Jacob, and then, okay, well, now we got Isaac. Well, that's two dimensional. But you want to go 3D in God? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's how the Lord describes himself. He says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a generational God. It's, it's branded even in his name and his self-description. And so I really believe that we have to be people that make room for the, the youngest to the oldest and see the, the, the profound beauty and value in each one, each generation, and what they have to offer. Does that make sense? And so God met with us in a mighty way. Uh, and... Um, you know, and then as this ministry transpired and, and we began to set into mission, uh, we began to serve the poor, start with the homeless, and then we went to inner city for many years. You've heard me tell stories, and we did that. And uh, then we had many years we were just kind of, you know, at, for, at first we were a, what they call a, a nonprofit or a parachurch. Uh, some would say a parasite. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but but we, were, we weren't actually a church, right? We were just 
out there doing the work. And eventually the Lord said, no, you need to become a church and grab hold of all the blueprint that I've given you to, to run with and, and walk in. And so we did. And, and um, we've had a series of different ways of walking that out. We had a school here. Uh, and we had for many years like 25 young people. When the school was on, it would be like 50 young people living on campus. So we had small groups. We had discipleship. We still have discipleship with the team here. But I, I believe the Lord's saying you got, it's got to be decentralized. You've got to spread the, the net further. And everyone needs to be able to use their, their gifting and prepare for the influx that is coming because I believe we are on the brink of another Jesus revolution. And so the, the, the Lord began to speak to us about this. And, and so we start with Jesus, the model, where he grabs his 12. And then we see that those are the very men that turn the world upside down. We're not afraid, not ashamed of Jesus, and even gave their lives for the advancement of the gospel. And so, uh, if now one thing that's peculiar about us, it shouldn't be. I pray it would change, and I think it is over time. But we, are, we really truly are a mission church. We're a church with a mission. We're, we're, we're not, na- we're not navel-gazing, if you, know, if, if you never noticed. We're not a church that's just like, come in here and soak. No. Well, you can soak and you can get filled. That's what we do on a Friday night, get filled up. But then we go, you know. The Lord gave me this rhythm early on. He said, he said that this church uh, should be um, uh, like, like breathing. The, it, inhale, exhale, as natural as breathing. Freely you receive, freely you give, freely you receive. And he said that's the only way to be healthy in the kingdom. Because if you try to inhale, I believe that's where we get stuck. So many, uh, so much of our Americanized church, we inhale, we inhale, we inhale. Hey, try it. Someone try it. Inhale. Okay, do it again. And again. You're going to blow up in a minute here, right? It doesn't feel that good after a while. You got to exhale. Like, you gotta, how do I give this away, all this, this oxygen of heaven and everything God's put in me? And so it's as natural as breathing, that rhythm of, of receiving and giving, receiving and giving. And so... One thing as I talk about this, like we're a bit of a hybrid because we we're like literally believe in missions in our own city, and not that we're we're something special, even though I know we're special. But I'm just saying that that sometimes isn't seen that often uh, in the way we do church, right? And so we we lot of, so many times people literally go away. You got to go away to do a mission trip. And I I told someone the other day, I said, man, every week feels like a mission. I'm like. We got so much going on right here in Nashville, in our Jerusalem, by the way, right? First in Jerusalem, take care of your own city, and then God will give you authority to Judea and Samaria and even to the ends of the earth, and that was the pattern. And so we look at that first century church, and we see um, that they, they, well, first of all, if we want New Testament results, which were profound, which turned the world upside down and spread Christianity, uh, all across the world, eventually, after 300 years, it became the state religion, even of the Roman Empire. And it says, then we, then we have to look at what they did, okay? And then eventually, we have to do what they did. If, if, if you go back and you see something that was profoundly successful, then we go back and look at it and go, what were they doing? So, um, so l- let me show you and l- just touch on multiplication, of how they grew. So we'll take a quick journey through the book of Acts. I'll, I'll go quickly through this, but... So we know that the day of Pentecost, 120 are are waiting in the upper room for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes. The gospel is preached through Peter. And that day, the Lord adds 3,000 to them, right, and baptized. And uh, those who accepted the message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. So they instantly, overnight, became a megachurch. Boom. Power of the Holy Spirit, okay? And then Acts chapter 2 uh, 47 says, and the Lord uh, added to their number daily those who are being saved. We read, we read about that. So we see that there's, mat- there's, there's addition to this great explosion of the church that began, but there's addition now. And then uh, Acts 4, verse 4 says, but many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Now that's just counting the men. So if you add women and children, I mean, you got, what, 15,000, 20,000, you know, if they had big families back then, you got even more. I mean, it's growing. It's adding addition. Now it starts to flip even into uh, multiplication. And uh, uh, believers, uh, well, let's go to, um, 
Oh, that's the same. It's just different translation. Uh, the, the New King James Version says, multitude, um, the believers were increased and added to the Lord multitudes, both men and women. So we see it just continues to multiply and to grow. We see in uh, Acts chapter 5, verse, um, let's go to 28. And when the, when, the, when the religious leaders of the day have given them strict orders not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore, and they say to them, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. So their, the, their opponent's description of the work that they're doing, the ministry that they're doing, says that you have filled Jerusalem. I mean, that's a big description. Like, Jerusalem is flooded with the gospel. And they're, they're not happy about it, right? And scholars say, Bible scholars say that around that time, Jerusalem was around 200,000, maybe 250,000 uh, inhabitants of that city. And, and they said that the, that church had grown to about 100,000 people. Almost half of the whole city had gotten saved in Jerusalem. Isn't that amazing? It said that many priests even gave their lives to the Lord. And, um, and so um, we see in chapter 6, now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there it is, uh, and so we're just, I'm just going to keep going. So uh, verse 7, there's actually so many of this about the increase and the multiplication. Uh, chapter 6, verse 7 says, And the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and many of the priests were obedient to the faith. Okay? And so we could just, you get the point, but you just keep going all through here, and you see multiplication, multiplication. We know ultimately there was persecution that actually scattered the church and then started to spread the gospel everywhere. They finally came out of the bubble that they were in of Jerusalem where they enjoyed favor of all men for a moment, for a season, and then eventually the persecution came. And, uh, and so let's take a look at this church. We touched on it earlier with the scripture that we read in Acts chapter 5, verse 42. Day after day, someone say day after day, in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. So they met in two places primarily here. The temple courts. Now, a lot of people think they, meant they met in the temple. That's not true because only the priests could go into the holy place, the most holy place. So they met in the courts, the outer courts. Uh, I heard Bible scholars saying if you look at the temple the way it was, it was designed, there was vast areas where like 50,000, 100,000 people could meet in the courts all around the temple. So they had, I believe, some mega gatherings, some mass gatherings, and they would come together to worship and, and listen to the apostles' teaching. But also, uh, they went house to house. And I love this thing. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus Christ. How were they effective? They never stopped. Once you start... God's design for you is that once you start, you're never to stop. Don't go on vacation or hiatus or I'm on sabbatical. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it's good to take seasons of rest, but I'm saying there's something about, man, our light got to keep shining. Does that make sense? And so they come together in a large group uh, for worship, for celebration, but then they come together in small groups or life groups uh, uh, for, for fellowship, primarily, for fellowship, to be known, to be seen, to, to, uh, to disciple in a, in a more intimate way, in a, uh, in a, in a way where, where you, can, you can't do, you can only do so, so much in a gathering like this. And, uh, and, and God wants to use both, as he did it in the first church. And so, um, also you think of that first church, there's another peculiarity, at least to us, is there, there was hardly any mobility. They, you know, at the fastest you could go is you jump on a horse or something. Maybe you steal a Roman chariot or something. Or, you know, but that, that's it. But So basically, people just walked. So they were in smaller communities, and they probably gathered in proximity. And now we're in a different day with, with of course, vehicles and mobilization and even internet, all these different things. And some of it is more convenient, and some of it's actually you have to be intentional to connect. Everyone's so busy in a time like this. Back then, they probably had lots of times. Well, day after day, it's like every other day, they're getting back together, fellowshipping, eating together with glad and sincere hearts, breaking bread. And so uh, we're in a time where 
we, we're going to have to be intentional, and we're, we're going to talk about location and things like that, but I just want to lay out the biblical mandate for this first. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, so why? What's the, what's the big point of, of uh, life groups? Like we talked, touched on some of it, but here's, here's some of the thoughts on, on why we would do such a thing, why we need such a thing, is that we need one another. Whether you like it or not, you know, we need one another. You, you, you see, the thing about the Lone Ranger is he always wore a mask. He was hiding something. <laughs> because he was alone. He was like, no one knew him. Does that make sense? That's just an analogy. But, but we need each other. The reality is we are all on enemy territory on planet Earth right now. And so the enemy seeks who he can devour. He always takes out the stragglers, the, the weak ones, the independent ones. I mean, if, you know, uh, a wolf doesn't just jump in the center of a flock. He just t- picks off the ones that are easy on the outside. The same thing with lions. They're waiting for the opportunity, okay? Um, and so we see that we're in a war, and uh, we're called to, in, in this war to be victorious and to be wise on how we wage this war. And we're not called to just... Uh, survive, merely survive. We're, we're called to thrive. So how can it, we have a thriving church here in, in Nashville, Tennessee? Now, we're a congregation. There's, I believe there's only one church, ultimately, okay? There's a church of Nashville in this region. But there's different congregations, different expressions. And the reality is, as you've heard many times before and hopefully believe, that we are the church. You are the church. You're that living stone. It's not just a building and, and so that's why we can spread out. We can go places. We can connect. And everywhere we go, there's light. There's light and there's connection with the Lord. Amen? So we all need not just community, but we need on, honesty. You need, a, you need a, a group of friends. You need a group of people around you where, where you, you build trust. You build relationship where you can be honest. You can say, you know what, I'm, I'm really going through something right now. I'm really fighting this temptation, or I, I got this doctor report, and I, I don't want to just share it with everyone, but I could share it with you. And, 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 and so we need to be known. We need to cover one another. We need to be able to tell the truth. We need to, uh, you know, so many people go to church, and we're just wasting time because we're, a lot of times we're just pretending to be okay or pretending to be known. I'm, I'm you know, I'm here, a little hop, skip, and jump for Jesus, and, but no one really knows what you're going through. And if we're going to bring in disciples and put them on the fast track, and we have to have healthy environments to bring people into. And we need spiritual fathers and mothers that are ready to embrace a young generation. Does this make sense? I heard someone say we need fat Christians. Fat Christians. Faithful, available, and teachable. That's how fat Christians up in here. Someone say faithful, available, teachable. And that T also could be transparent. Right? Open, vulnerable. That's where, that's where you can go when you get in a small group. You can, you know, you can go there. And you be, begin to build relationships. I've met so many people that once they get in these groups and once you kind of lock in and God begins to work, I, that, that they've, they've said, man, that we still have relationships with people that we were in that small group with decades. It can last because you're, you're in it together. Now, Another way to bond, there's two things that I, wanted, I was, was starting to touch on, is missions, okay? When you're in the trenches together, when you're working, when you're doing the work of the Lord together, you, you, you know that those disciples had to bond big time when they're out there casting out demons and like, whoo, did you see that? Well, you remember that time? I mean, I mean, there's things that happen on the front lines. But I, I want to say that an army doesn't just jump on the front lines. They have to be prepared in a secret place. They have to be trained they have to know each other as brothers to cover one another's backs. And then from there, there's a synergy, there's an energy, there's an inertia that begins to push them out. Just like happened to us from our Thursday night prayer meeting where God said, well, you going to do something about all this? You're just going to sit here and read the Bible for the rest of your life. The Bible's profound. I highly recommend it. However, doing the Bible is even better. Yeah. Amen? Oh, here we go. So we don't, the problem with today's world, we don't need more, so much more content. We got content out the wazoo. We got internet. We got any message you want at any time. We have so much, we need context. 
We need to, to know people. We need to be known. Does this make sense? We need to get to a place where uh, it's iron, iron sharpening iron. And that was the, the motto of our, uh, when we started the foundry. The foundry is a place where you do metal works and you melt down stuff, purify, and it comes out into a useful unit and you're brought together to make engines for the marathon cars down the road here, this old building. And so the Lord said, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. And so we got to get close enough that some sparks could fly every once in a while. Oh, wait a second. Did I say that? No, it's, it's true. A lot of people, they, they get hurt once, and they're just like, I don't want to get in close proximity ever again. I'll just stay out here kind of aloof, kind of floating out here, a mobile Christian just kind of landing like on a, on a little flower here, a little flower there. But you got no, you know, how good would a bee be if it didn't have a home base to go back to, it didn't have a hive to go back to? You just land on flowers and meaninglessness. There's nowhere to go back. There's no way to generate honey or multiply or anything. You, does this make sense? I just came up with that right at that moment. That was pretty good. <laughs> All right. So uh, Jesus said that he'll make us fishers of men. How many people believe that? And so part of this small groups, too, that I love is I, I touched on it with a few people before, but there, in, in England, when England was like going negative numbers, going backwards where, where they're, the church is just shrinking and they're emptying out these beautiful buildings. There's no one there anymore. There was a movement about two or three decades ago called Alpha Groups where they actually began to say, we're, we're going to just begin to invite people into your homes, the lost, the sinners, your neighbors, whoever, and, 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 and have fellowship and break bread. And then they began to have curriculum like, here's how you can start a conversation about God, about the meaning of life. And you tell them, we're going to go to the Bible for some answers, but we're going to process this together. And so there's a way that these small groups, these home groups, can really bring new people in that maybe you, you probably some of you have friends that would, would come to your house and hang out with you as you build a relationship, maybe before they would come to a church, to a corporate meeting, right? And so there's so many ways that God wants to use this, but he wants us to be fishers of men, bringing in the new fish. It's not about, so many times I get concerned about Nashville because um, there's not a lot of evangelism. Have you noticed? We've got church in every corner, but, you know, we're mostly just, it's like having a bunch of aquariums. We're just switching fish from one aquarium. Uh, my aquarium is bigger than your aquarium. It's like we're just, you know, moving fish from one aquarium to the next. It's like, and, and I, I want a church where we bring in, uh, bring in the harvest. We bring in new people and new believers, and they're getting saved daily, and God's adding you know, all those other believers, they can stay where they are. It doesn't matter. Lord bless them all. If God calls them, it's fine. However, I want to see a church that's uh, penetrating society, that's a light in the darkness, that's bringing in the fish, as Jesus said. I'll make you fish as a man. That was a great fishing expedition Friday night. It was, those kids were so ready to pop. You know, by the time Daniel said, one, two, three, stand for Jesus, boom, 30 kids stood up all at once. Boom. It was amazing. And we're, we're coming into a time, guys, where I believe, you know, there's a movie coming out, The Jesus Revolution, reminiscing of what happened in the hippie days in the early 70s and how God poured out his spirit in a time where it was distressing and there's rebellion and, and, and free love and sex and drugs and, and, and independence and, you know, curse the government, and question authority, all that stuff. It just, it looked concerning for a concerned parents. They're like, are you kidding me? Like, where is this going to go? And they said that the Jesus movement... Was, was literally the fruit of concerned mothers praying for their kids in a time of great distress when it looked like they had lost all their, their children, their generation had just gone the way of the world with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And instead, the whole thing turned around. I can't tell you how many people I've met. They're like, let me guess. If they're just a little older than me, I'm like, let me guess. You were saved in 1970 and 1973. Yeah, how did you know? Because everybody was. <laughs> Everyone just got swept into the kingdom. What if God is about ready to release that again? And so we have to have a way to disciple people and bring them in. Sarah and I can't do it. Well, I'll guarantee you we can't. I need a vacation. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I'll call it a sabbatical. <laughs> Dress it up a little bit there. Uh, no, but we, we get tired sometimes. We need people to hold up our arms. We need, more importantly, we need you to operate in your gifting and your calling and raise, raise people up. Amen? Yeah. What you're created for. And so, um, so what is it? It's a, I said, we're, we're gonna, we chose to, to call it a life group because we believe it's that much, it's that vital for our existence of, to be connected. Um, 
We talked about we want it to be generational. Um, we, 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 we're starting to already identify different homes and people that have already said, yeah, I would love to host a life group in my home. And we're starting to look at the map of Nashville. And, we, you know, it's pretty, pretty kind of, I think it's kind of neat that we're like right in the center of Nashville. And then all around, we got people from the whole circumference, from the east side, north, south. I mean, you look around. And so we're going to begin. We're, we're okay with starting small. We're not trying to, you know, it, it could be as big as God wants it to be. But we just believe it's, it's a time to begin to gather together. And, and um, so you, you might say, when? When does this begin? We're looking at the, the month of March. March has always been a, 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 a time of initiatives, new initiatives. That we, March 4th, you know. Uh, <coughs> and, um, and so we believe that March were to begin. We do recommend what we're, and, and we're going to have a meeting for some leaders that want to get trained and preparation for this. So if you have it on your heart, we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, and so, but we're going to uh, recommend, we're just going to start doing two times a month. You say, well, we need to do it every week. Well, maybe it could evolve into that. But right now, because we we so value also the serving the poor Thursday nights and touching our city Friday nights, the, the worship and the fire that hits Broadway, and the other outreaches that we do, there's so many things that, and, and Tuesday night prayer right here, uh, a house of prayer, that, that we don't want to like just make everyone so busy that there's so many things going on. You got the bridge happening, which is amazing. On, uh, was it, is that every first Saturday for 30 and up, 30 to 50 or 49, or whatever, however you guys do it? Um, but that's amazing. Tremendous reports of what's happening there. And so, uh, there's a lot going on, and, and we like that, but we do think there's a really a place for people to get connected in a deeper way in these life groups. So we'll probably be picking just uh, either the fir first or third or the f f second and fourth just to get started. Uh, probably a Wednesday is what it's looking like. Just so we, None of this is in stone yet, but we got a glory train on Wednesday. Did you see that? <clears throat> yes, Lord. <laughs> But we, we, but we want to fit it in where it fits in the rhythm. If people want to serve the poor, you know, uh, if they want to go to the streets, they want to be part of all these other things. And, and I do believe there's a balance of, I think sometimes you can have a, a, a life group that can get just too ingrown as well. So why not take your life group and go, hey, let's, let's go down and serve Meal of Hope, you know, let's, or let's go down and intercede for the city. Let's do that together as a unit. That's really all that happened with, this ministry. We we're just a, a Thursday night prayer life group, and we said, hey, let's go do something together. We all know each other. We all got each other's backs. We're, we're covered. We're connected. We've gone deep in the scripture, and we're just ready to do something about it now. And that's how it all began. That's the, the, the genesis of this church, and we believe that we're, again, the first will be last. I believe there's a time to bring it on back. Yes, Lord. So, um, there it is. Wow, I ended early. Let's, <laughs> let's see what Holy Spirit wants to do now. So basically, uh, just to recap a couple things, if you've not tracked fully, we're going to launch life groups. We're going to launch Lord willing, and he doesn't come back beforehand. <laughs> uh, we're going to launch in March, Okay. Uh, we have a gathering for some leaders that want to host that have shared interest in that. That's coming up. Just talk to us about that. Um, and we want to entrust to good and faithful people. We're not just going to put anyone in that we don't know, but people we build a relationship with or connect who we trust. And then uh, there'll be some guidance towards some curriculum or, or a, a particular way to study. There'll be, but the primary uh, goal of these life groups is fellowship is to get together, to be connected, to pray for one another, to cover one another, to do life together. Does that make sense? Anyone like doing life together? Woo! Amen. And so, um, yeah, let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we see the success of the first century church, Lord. And we're in awe. It's remarkable, Lord, what you did, how you spread the gospel and, and how they were tenacious. They never stopped sharing the gospel. They never stop connecting and, and going deep with one another, that this gospel was never lost. It was never fumbled. It advanced and multiplied. And Lord, I just bless all the homes, all the families, and Lord, from the 
north side in Hendersonville to, to Lebanon and Mount Juliet and Hermitage and Lord, on, on, out on the east side and Lord, uh, on the south side, of course, Franklin and Columbia, Spring Hill. We got people, all of these areas, Brentwood. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for Bellevue. We thank you for the whole circumference of this city, Lord, the greater Nashville area. And I pray Nashville will be greater because of uh, what happens in, in home groups and, re- and authentic relationships. And, Lord, that people will be able to, to go deeper and go places they couldn't otherwise go together. Lord, we just ask that you would bless, Lord, uh, the launching of this and that, Father God, that people would be known and heard and seen in a way that can't be done in a, in a corporate gathering like this, Lord. Well, Holy Spirit, we ask that you be the orchestrator of this, that, Lord, there would be no laboring in the flesh. The servant of the Lord should not strive. So, Lord, we just trust you to build your church. Unless you build it, we labor in vain. But, Lord, we just are grateful for what you're going to be doing, Father God. In preparation for this great harvest, you, you spoke to us about the greatest harvest that would come. We want to be ready, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.